Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Corey. Welcome to the pre-work webinar for part two. I will be moderating today's event. I'd like to mention a few quick items before we begin. First of all, please make note of the features available to you within your GoToWebinar internet browser. In the lower right corner of your screen, you could see the chat box where you can find your questions, where you can submit your questions to Dr. Rosier. There will be answered at the end of the presentation as time allows. This should be after part two. Dr. Rosier's presentation will be about two hours in length and will be sending all attendees the recorded version. It is my privilege to welcome Dr. Neil Rosier for today's webinar from his hometown in Palm Springs, California. Hello, Neil. Hi, Mary. Good morning, and hello, everyone. Um, no, I'm not in Palm Springs today. Um, a little different change in venue. Um, it's always 35 bright, sunshiny skies and beautiful in Palm Springs. Uh, I'm actually up at the ski resort where I work. Uh, Carolyn is out skiing while I'm doing the webinar. Um, we have uh, presently over 650 inches of snow so far this year, which has surpassed our all-time record. Uh, most of the homes are being excavated by excavators because the snow is up and over the top of the roofs. Um, it's just absolutely, thoroughly phenomenal the amount of snow up here, and everyone's still trying to dig out. So the good news is the drought is over. Anyway, good morning, everyone. This is section one of part two. Um, the intent of this first lecture is to explain why we do what we do. Um, part one was a lot of um, journal articles, medical review, why we do what we do, um, the medical support for it. This is more of a general lecture that I have given to medical academies in the past to try to explain why we do what we do. And there's a couple different aspects of it that I want to go through with my usual sarcasm that I try not to use in the, the lectures themselves, um, but I can um, with this to try to explain to all of you that it just makes no sense why, let me use the term, mainstream medicine continues to do, promote what they do, and ignore the medical literature and the studies to tell us what we really should be doing. There's a multitude of benefits as far as health are concerned. There's a multitude of benefits as far as uh, feel-good effects are concerned, and I want to share those with everyone because I didn't get a, a chance to do that in part one, um, but I, I want to do a nice general lecture on what we should be doing for our general health, and, and all physicians should be doing this. So that is the intent of this first section, to try to explain um, why we do what we do. This course used to be called an anti-aging course. Um, I also lecture for the National Procedures Institute, which is owned by the Texas Academy of uh, Family Practice. And for years, we had this course um, named anti-aging. And when the AAFP bought it and took it over, they notified me that um, they would no longer be needing my services because the course did not meet their standards. And when I asked them what exactly that meant, they said, well, they don't really like anti-aging, the term of it. And I said, well, then why don't you change the term to something else? Why don't you call it preventive medicine instead? Because that's basically what it is. And they said, well, we still don't like the course itself. And I said, well, before you nix the course, the hierarchy needs to attend the course, and then you can decide if you really want to get rid of the course. And of course, there were five people from AAFP that attended the course and said, you know, yeah, this is the best course they've ever attended. The way it's preventive medicine is its finest. No, we won't nix the course. We'll keep the course. And it is always their best attended course. The other courses, they may get 10 or 15 people. They always end up with 30 or 40, and they always end up going over. So it is their most popular favorite course and also the most profitable for them. So they decided not to nix it, but they said, we have to change the name. Uh, We've got to get rid of anti-aging. We don't like that term. Nobody likes that term. I don't like that term because nobody else likes it. So they said, well, um, what do you think? And I said, well, let's call it preventive medicine. So we put out, um, we changed the name of the course, same course, and we used the term preventive medicine. Um, well, the next year, as it remains preventive medicine, they had like five people sign up for each course. Um, so anyway, that was a big flop. 
And so I said, why don't you change it back to anti-aging and just deal with it? I changed it back to anti-aging the next year. Every course filled up with 50 people, and they were happy, and it's been the anti-aging course ever since then. But nevertheless, I will show you how the AMA denigrates anti-aging. I will explain how there's adverse um, opinions and um, negativity to the term anti-aging. So um, I also strongly suggest that you do not use the term anti-aging in any of your material. Um, I suggest that you remove it from any material that you use. Your web uh, sites that you use, I suggest that you remove it uh, and not use it. So what term do we use in place of it? I don't know. I I'm not quite sure. Uh, the term is complicated. Uh, it's complex. It's really ill-defined. It's confusing, misunderstood, denigrated by mainstream medicine. Um, but still, um, I don't think that we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. So how do you define anti-aging? Let's define aging. Um, what happens when you get old? Um, well, you lose protein synthesis, you lose your immune function, you lose muscle, you lose strength, endurance, um, you get fat, you lose bone, uh, there's an increase in all the age-related diseases that kill us. So it's extremely important to replace hormones to prevent all of these things from occurring. Um, well, that's great, but what term should we use? What term can we call it? Um, back in 1990, there was an article that was written in the New England Journal of Medicine by um, a doctor who termed the effects of growth hormone that were seen reverse the changes in aging that were seen over the prior 10 years. And at that point in time, the term anti-aging was coined. And it's been called anti-aging ever since because of the improvements that we see. But if we don't use that term, anti-aging, then what term can we use? I, I'm not really quite sure. So let's look at the possibilities. Um, when you get old, you lose hormones. Hormones will help prevent weakness, impaired mobility, loss of strength and endurance, loss of energy, loss of desire to do things, our work competence. Uh, we get pain, we get muscle aches, we get joint aches. Um, and when we're in pain, we have less activity. And as a result, we move less. And when we move, move less, then we deteriorate. So the whole key is, is to try to prevent all this from occurring in the first place. Don't wait until that occurs and say, okay, now let's try to reverse it. Um, what we should do is to implement a therapy uh, to try to prevent that from occurring in the first place. That sort of makes sense. So as you get older, you fall down, you lose your balance, and then you fracture, and then you have impairment of activity, loss of independence, poor quality of life. And patients want a better quality of life. They don't really want to go to the doctor and be put on a, a bunch of medications um, that they don't want to take, that have side effects problems, and they want to try to avoid those medications. So how can we avoid the medicines? How can we avoid the problems and complications that we see as we get older? Um, this is exactly what anti-aging or preventive medicine is all about. Unfortunately, it's not well embraced by mainstream medicine. Um, there's lack of pharma pharmaceutical support for it. Um, and of course, the adage for many doctors is, well, you know, um, I know you feel lousy, I know you look lousy, I know you're deteriorating, but you know, here, take this cholesterol medicine, take the diabetes medicine, take the blood pressure medicine, but that makes me feel worse. Well, Fred, you're just getting old. Martha, just deal with it, you're just getting old. Um, and unfortunately, patients know and understand what hormones are all about, but doctors are not. They're not well informed and they're against it, which is really a shame. So the therapy is patient-driven, it's not doctor-driven. There's a few doctors in my area that will refer patients to me. Um, but most of the time, most doctors are against it. They don't understand it. There's no AMA support for it. But yet, as we saw in part one, it's all evidence-based medicine. It's just simply ignored by mainstream medicine. And it shouldn't be. We should not ignore these studies. We should not ignore the literature. Why do they do the study? So that we can learn from it. Why do they publish it? So that we can learn and understand maybe what we should be doing. Then why do we ignore it? It makes no sense whatsoever. So patients are requesting anything to help maintain quality of life. They want to feel better. They want to function better. They don't want to take drugs and medications, and they want to maintain that activity. Um, it's called preventive medicine. We used to call it anti-aging medicine. I suggest that you don't call it that anymore. Um, it's feel-good medicine. It's basically average everyday medicine that every doctor should know and understand and practice and preach 
and it should be embraced by mainstream medicine, and it should be embraced by all patients. It's just one of those things, again, that falls between the cracks, which is very unfortunate. Until we can get into the DNA, um, hormones are our best method so far of reducing the morbidity and mortality that we see from the diseases of aging, uh, and how to preserve our independence, our strength, our quality of life, how to reduce those symptoms, um, how to not deteriorate and get the aches and pains, uh, and then try to take the pain medicine to get rid of those pains. Um, preservation of health and wellness is really what we should focus on, and I showed you multiple articles in part one, and we'll go through that uh, also in part two to look at what the med medical literature support for what we do and why we do is so beneficial, and it's so much evidence-based, and it's a shame that mainstream medicine just doesn't get it. The flip side to that is I always look at the silver lining. Uh, maybe it's good that mainstream medicine doesn't get it. Well, it's not good for the patients, but maybe it's good for us because the more that my family doctors don't understand, the more the patients will come to me and I can make them feel better, and I can make them love life. I can make them get off of the medications that they don't want to take. The second section of this morning's lecture will be looking at lifespan. But more importantly, we really want to increase and extend health span. When you increase health span, you will extend lifespan. Uh, no one wants to live forever. No one wants to be in that nursing home in that fetal position, uh, not able to move or function. Um, we don't want the debility. We don't want the chronic illness. We don't want the cognitive impairment. For 40 years, the pharmaceutical industry has spent billions of dollars trying to prevent and reverse Alzheimer's disease. We are no further along the road as far as treatments or prevention than we were 40 years ago. And we've spent billions in all of these new drugs to try to reverse and, and remove beta amyloid protein from the neurons have failed miserably, unfortunately. But yet, for those of you that attended part five last year and saw the benefits uh, that I gave in the brain lecture of all the hormones, it's just mind boggling, pun intended, um, what hormones do for the brain and to protect against Alzheimer's disease and to actually even reverse it. Um, we'll get into that later in part four when I will repeat those lectures on the brain and all the benefits of hormones. I mean, it's just phenomenal the data and the studies that are there from the neurology literature and from the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. What's there? And we ignore it and we completely do not understand because we do not understand the literature. I am trying to make everyone be analytical thinkers as opposed to reactionaries. The reactionaries will say, well, the studies show that hormones are bad, estrogen's bad, you shouldn't take it, take it for a short period of time and stop it. That's the reactionary. The analytical thinker will say, well, yeah, that's true, that's what Premarin showed, but that's not what we see with estradiol. In fact, every study with estradiol shows protection of our brain. It reverses beta amyloid protein. It protects against the deposition of beta amyloid protein and it actually reverses it. And we see that in the spec scans. Then what is it that we don't understand? Well, you can't take estrogen because it's harmful. <laughs> no, it's not harmful. Uh, you're extrapolating the harm of permanent estradiol. Well, you have to assume that they're the same. No, they're not the same. And all the studies show that they're not the same. But the problem is, is that mainstream medicine does not understand or know or realize those studies. The reactionary, they're not analytical thinkers. I want you to become analytical thinkers to be able to understand what mainstream medicine is missing, why they miss it, why they extrapolate and assume and incorrectly make suppositions. I want you to be able to look through that and think through that and look at what the data and what the studies show. And then you'll be able to understand what we can do for the brain. How many hormones improve the brain? DHEA, thyroid, estradiol, testosterone, growth hormone. All of those have been shown to reverse beta amyloid protein deposition and improve cognition and memory. What is it that we don't understand about all this literature and all these studies? Well, you can't take them, they're bad. Well, they're not bad. You're extrapolating that which is bad to that which has been good in every study. So who would not want to extend this vitality and compress morbidity into a very small, limited time? That's the key to what we do for anti-aging medicine. And get the concept in your head. It's preventive medicine. That's simply what it is. Vitality extension, morbidity compression through preventive medicine. What a concept. 
everyone should embrace it. It's a shame that they don't. If we increase our lifespan, uh, then we want to be happy, we want to be healthy, we want to be vigorous, happy, content, healthy, motivated, free of disease and illness, which is the key. Um, sorry, the drugs that we often use do not reverse the disease and illness. You can reverse it and you can improve it and prevent it by optimizing your hormones. So what drug does all of the above? It makes us feel better, function better, it makes us healthy. There is not one drug that does this, but it's interesting that all of us mainstream physicians push the drugs that don't. And all the ones that do, and I don't want to call them drugs, I want to call them hormones, are the ones that prevent. But we simply don't get it. We don't grasp it. We don't understand it. And it is my passion to try to explain this to doctors so that they do get it. Traditional medicine. We can treat the disease once you get it. Anti-aging medicine. Why do you need to get the disease in the first place? Focus on prevention. Um, we can change the pathology. Uh, from the get-go, why wait in, until we get the illness uh, when we can simply prevent it? And, and that's the whole key, and we'll look at this in Section 2 on all the different hormones that prevent, that we fail to understand and acknowledge and embrace it. So let's forget the term anti-aging. And by the way, I want to thank Dana and Mary for putting together all the slides for this course. They're fantastic. Uh, and for Dana now creating this, instead of using the term anti-aging, let's use the term the science of creating health. That's what it is. Let's use that. Does that make sense? Yes. Does all the literature support that? Yes. Okay. So from now on, it will be, well, what kind of practice? What, what, people always ask me, well, what do you lecture on? And I go, I lecture on the science of creating health. And I go, what the hell is that? Um, it's preventive medicine. Oh, I think I understand that. I don't use the term anti-aging anymore because people don't quite grasp that or they'll denigrate it. So the science of creating health is the application of any therapy or modality, vitamins, supplements, lifestyle change, hormones, to deliver and diagnose the early detection, prevention, treatment, or reversal of age-related dysfunction and disease. What a concept. What a great paragraph that all physicians should embrace and should understand why we do what we do. Um, by doing so, we enhance the quality of our life. It ex extends the quality of our life as well as our lifespan and our health span. So that is the goal of anti-aging medicine, preventive medicine, age management medicine, whatever term you want to use. It's the science of creating health. And it should be a new specialty. It enhances the quality of life. That's what patients want. For those of you who have been doing this for a while and understand it, we can make patients feel better. Oh, I wish I had a dollar for every time a patient has come to me and said, you've given me my life back. The spouses have come to me and said, you've saved my marriage. You've saved me. You've saved me from my job. I was circling the drain. And now that I'm on hormones, I can't believe how much better I feel and how I function. I got my life back. I feel so much better. And you'd be surprised the number of patients that feel that, experience that, and come back and compliment me on it and will say, my doctor is clueless. My doctor doesn't understand. My doctor thinks that I need to get off all these hormones. My doctor thinks that I don't need to be on thyroid. But I feel so much better. I know. Don't expect your doctor to know and understand what we do. Just because you know and understand it does not make your doctor know and understand it. The science of creating health uses cutting-edge technologies to detect, prevent, and treat age-related disease. It's scientifically based. It's evidence-based medicine. Everything I do and I teach and I preach comes from some medical journal article, and I usually back that up with many articles on the same topic. It's well-documented and demonstrated in our peer-reviewed journals. It's preventive medicine. It's quality of life medicine. What a concept. But yet, it's not embraced, and I'll show you shortly how it's not embraced and why it's not embraced. So don't lose sight of what our science is trying to tell us. Why do we do the studies? So we learn. Why do they publish it? So that we can learn. And then why do we ignore it? That's the question. Well, because it's not in our thinking. It's not what we, we, we do. It should be, but it's not what we were taught or trained to do. People often ask me, well, when are we going to start teaching this in medical schools, in our residencies? I don't know. But nevertheless, I can at least show and train and teach doctors to use evidence-based medicine to support why we do 
and how we do what we do. Use the evidence-based medicine to guide us in our therapies, and that's why I give you all of these article studies and data to support why we do what we do. You can give it to patients. You can give it to your peers. You can tuck it away and understand what you have not understood for the last 10, 20, or 30 years, but that you now understand. So instead of simply trying to treat this disease and these problems, why don't we try to prevent it from the first place? And all the studies that I've given you show that we can prevent it. You can prevent coronary artery disease. You can prevent cancer by decreasing visceral fat. You can prevent dementia by all the hormones. And you can prevent insulin resistance and the deterioration, arthritis, joint deterioration, loss of muscle ligaments, joints, tendons, bones, anything that holds us upright, our structure. We can prevent the deterioration in our immune system. And we can make what makes the world go round better. Sexual function, libido, energy. We can treat the cause, the aging. It's just basically getting older. The AMA, the FDA, and AACE have now come out trying to restrict the use of testosterone in men. We can't have everyone writing prescriptions for testosterone. Why? Well, because, you know, we, we, we just can't have it. Yes, but every study shows that there's benefit to it. Well, we, just, we, we can't have it. We shouldn't do it. Um, it's only FDA approved for treating a disease of the gonads or the pituitary. If you don't have a disease of the gonads or pituitary, then you don't qualify for it. Yes, but it's the aging that's causing our levels to fall. Well, that's not approved for that. It doesn't mean you can't use it for that, but it's not FDA approved for that. And that's what the zealots are trying to now do is to show us you cannot, should not use it because it's not FDA approved for it. Well, great. That doesn't mean you can't use it. You can use it off-label. 95% of the prescriptions for hormones are for off-label use. And it's basically preventive medicine. Don't get hung up on, well, there's no disease of the gonads. Therefore, it's not indicated. It is very much indicated for quality of life. This is a nice definition of what we used to use the term anti-aging, but the science of maintaining health is. There's a number of aspects of the aging process that invite the development of routine medical intervention programs. That's a hormone replacement program, offering long-term replacement, not short-term as per ACOG and NAMS, that's PremPro, we don't use PremPro, long-term replacement with one or more hormones in order to delay the aging process and to allow us to live for a prolonged period of time in a relatively intact and healthy state. What a concept. That is the definition of quality of life medicine. That is the definition of maintaining health type medicine. That is why we do what we do. Quality of life, preventive medicine, age management medicine. Um, what other terms could we use? Feel good medicine, preventing depression, reversing depression, making life fun again medicine. That's essentially what it is. And all the literature supports this. These are terms that, are, that I took from those articles. All hormones restored to 25 to 30 year old levels and monitored by regular serum levels. Um, I sort of disagree with that because in part one I showed you a dozen articles where your thyroid, testosterone, DHEA, sometimes estradiol, Levels have to be super physiologic, above the range. But zealots will say, no, you can't go above that range. Well, that range is a range of average for old, sick people. Perfect. If you want to be in the range for old, sick people, well, then that's fine. Then absolutely you can do that. But I think that's more of a, shall we say, an advertisement to attract people. We're going to take your levels back to what you had when you were younger. Okay, that's great. Um, no, I take my levels back to where symptoms improve. Um, one of the physicians recently emailed me and said, you know, we need to get away from these numbers. You know, get rid of these numbers because all the studies show that you're going to have to be super physiologic. Women have to be total testosterone at 2 to 400 in order to feel better. If you keep your level at normal of less than 70, you're not going to see or feel anything. You're not going to get that benefit. It has to be super physiologic, but the zealots will say, no, but it's, it's, something bad can happen. No, every study with super physiologic shows good. It doesn't show bad. So 
I use the number as a guide to my therapy. We'll look more in part two at numbers and the numbers that I use to achieve benefit. And the numbers will scare you because they're very high above normal. I don't shoot for normal. I shoot for optimal. With natural bioidentical hormones, whatever term you want to use, it's the same identical molecular structure. It is not something that is chemically altered. It's not something that's synthetic that has an adverse effect like medroxyprogesterone, acetate, and some of the other synthetic hormones that are used. It's quite simple in concept. Uh, the hormones that we have discussed in part one are listed. What are the effects on feel-good medicine? Um, sexual confidence, increased libido for men and women, increased sexual pleasure and performance for men and women. Note that the FDA has not approved testosterone for women. So, as a result, AACE in the last statement says, we cannot recommend it for women. Yeah, but what about the several hundred studies to show benefit? Well, we ignore it. And because we can't come up with a number and can't define a deficiency, therefore, and there's no FDA approved testosterone for women, then we don't recommend it. Yes, but look at all the benefit that you're missing if you don't prescribe it. Improve sexual pleasure and performance. Improve body image. It burns fat. It maintains muscle. Life is good again for men and women. Even into our 90s, I have told you the number of octogenarians and older that I have that love each other and still continue to have sex and have energy and go out and have fun and play. And that would certainly not be possible without being on hormones. I have some patients that have been on hormones for over 20 years. They started in their 70s. Now they're in their 90s. They still feel and function great. What a concept. Strength, confidence. It helps improve lean body mass, muscle mass, strength, endurance. You can do this with the anabolic hormones, growth hormone, testosterone, DHEA. There's a dramatic increase in strength and resistance exercise in every study that's looked at it. But yet the AMA, the FDA, AACE says we don't recommend testosterone in older men. We don't want them to have increased strength and better quality of life. We don't want them to build muscle. We don't want them to burn fat. Why not? We don't want them to have improved healing. Why not? Because we just don't. That's so nonsensical, I, I just can't believe it. But you have to understand the politics and economics behind their wanting to restrict the use of it. But when you restrict, then people will lose all these benefits. They have got to be out of their mind. But if you understand politics and economics, you understand why they're doing what they're doing. That doesn't mean you can't prescribe it. It can't mean, doesn't mean you can't utilize it. You're using it for off-label use to benefit your patients. And I document that. It's for off-label use. And you should document that in your notes when you prescribe hormones, particularly when you're using hormones when the levels are in the normal range. You're using it to help improve wellness, strength, energy, endurance, quality of life, and to decrease the diseases that we see with aging. It helps improve intelligence, memory, cognition, creativity. DHEA does this. Estrogen does this. Thyroid does it. High doses of T3. Testosterone does it. Every study shows the same. I hope you're all aware of the most recent study that came out. It was published. It was one of seven different studies uh, with androgel. And the one study showed that in men that took androgel, there was no improvement in memory or cognition. Well, I wouldn't expect it to be. They use androgel. It's a 1% gel. They got their levels from 200 up to 400. Wow. Um, gee, um, I can't figure out why they didn't see any improvement. It doesn't mean it didn't work. So what did that study show? The study showed that testosterone does not improve. No, that's not what it showed. It shows that in their study, in those patients that took a low dose of a 1% testosterone gel, they did not derive any benefit when their levels went from 300 to 400. That's the conclusion of the study. It does not mean that testosterone does not work. It does not mean that you throw out the other 200 studies that show that testosterone does work to improve memory, cognition, creativity, and to prevent Alzheimer's disease. A poorly done study with a dose that does not achieve anything should not be used to trump all the other studies where they use good doses and good levels and they show benefit. You can see how people will fall into this trap of, 
reactionary. Oh, it shows that it doesn't work anymore. Uh, no. In that patient population using androgel in a very low dose, it did not work. Don't extrapolate that to what happens when you use a good dose, a 20% cream, to get your levels from 300 to 1800, not from 300 to 400. I wouldn't expect it to improve anything. That's a worthless study. It's flawed in its design because the doses that they used were not adequate. That doesn't mean it does not work. Salubrious, prevents the degenerative diseases of aging. All of the hormones, estrogen and all the anabolic hormones, testosterone, DHEA, growth hormone, have been shown to prevent the deterioration that we see in our muscle, ligaments, joints, tendons, bones, and skin. When we feel and function better, it improves our quality of life. It eliminates the depression that we get. There's a nice article that recently appeared in Scientific American that called antidepressants a drug with a strong placebo effect. Pretty interesting. Um, in most circumstances, antidepressants don't work for most people because you're really not depressed. You feel lousy. And when you feel lousy, it makes you depressed. And when you're no longer feeling lousy, you're no longer depressed. That's the antidepressant effect of the hormones. I think everyone should be on hormones instead of antidepressants because in most circumstances, they don't work. It helps your immune system. It fights infections. It helps healing of injuries. A lot of the stem cell centers are now insisting that patients that do stem cells or PRP do it in conjunction with hormones. That's the key. That's the secret to prolonging your benefit. And, of course, most importantly, a concept that most physicians do not understand, and, of course, the FDA, AACE, and zealots do not understand, numbers and levels are meaningless. It's a nice guide but they're absolutely meaningless as far as predicting who is going to have symptoms and they're meaningless as far as predicting who is going to improve. Almost everyone will improve if you use a high enough dose and get the levels up. And the reason is is because you stimulate more receptor sites, which results in better signal transduction and biological activity of that hormone. But yet everyone wants to restrict based on number. They don't need it because their number is not below that magical range. Yeah, but everyone that takes it feels better. Yeah, but they don't qualify for it because of the number. The numbers are meaningless. Next course, we'll look at all of the studies that show numbers are meaningless and they do not predict who's going to have symptoms and who will improve. How do you then figure out who's going to improve? It's trial and error. You give the hormones. And then when they improve, patients want to continue it. I've never seen any man on testosterone, I've never seen any woman on thyroid that says, no, nah, I don't want to take it anymore. I, I, didn't feel, I didn't feel good on it. Everyone feels better if you use enough of it. So normal hormone levels are not optimal levels. Normal does not guarantee maximum clinical efficacy or symptomatic improvement. You have to understand that everyone is stuck on normal. No one is stuck on optimal. No one quite understands that you have to be optimal or super physiologic in order to get efficacy and to get symptomatic improvement. Most people, unfortunately, do not understand that concept. It's in the literature, we see it clinically, but everyone tends to ignore it, which is unfortunate. So again, in spite of what the literature says, your peers will think you need to stay in the normal range and they will not understand. So you're gonna to have to understand how to counter that and explain it. This requires an understanding that if the receptor site Sensitivity, attachment of the hormone, the ligand to the receptor site, and signal transduction in the side of the cell, the results in the physiologic effect. It has nothing to do with the number. So there's so many other factors involved, but the zealots want to use a number to restrict. They want to use a number to say you shouldn't go above that, and they just do not understand. So why does AACE want to restrict hormone administration based purely on numbers rather than on symptomatic improvement? They do it for political reasons, which is very unfortunate. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen the endocrinologist testify, thyroid wasn't indicated, the TSH is normal. DHA is not indicated unless you have adrenal failure. Testosterone is not indicated. They don't qualify because their level is not less than 300. It's thoroughly amazing the people that should be the experts and know this completely do not know their own medical literature and do not understand hormones, which is a very sad commentary for medicine. 
But on the other hand, for those of us that understand it, practice it, preach it, it's completely changed our practices, it's completely changed the lives of our patients. So our goal is to restore hormone levels to the normal range of a young adult, optimal, the upper end of that range, and not the normal range of old adults. But more importantly, in every study that I read, is to alleviate symptoms of hormone deficiency. You use the number as a guide, but we want to help improve health and wellness, but we also want to help improve symptoms. And if your symptoms are not improved, but you're afraid of that number, then refer the patient to me and let me fix them. I didn't make this up. I quoted this from one of the articles in JCEM. The ultimate goals are to maintain the highest quality of life, to reduce disability, to compress major illness into a narrow age range, and to add life to years. What a concept. This is out of JCEM. I don't know who wrote this. I couldn't have written it better myself. That should be our goal. But yet, that's not our goal. Our goal is to lower cholesterol, lower blood sugar, lower blood pressure. What about the visceral fat? Ignore it. What about subcutaneous fat? Ignore it. Well, but that's the source that's causing everything, and we can get rid of that visceral fat by utilizing hormones. No, we'll just use these drugs instead. It makes no sense whatsoever. They just don't get it. I didn't spend much time on part one on growth hormone because it's a hormone that I infrequently prescribe, and the reason I infrequently prescribe it is because it costs about $1,000 a month, and most people can't, won't afford that. But I want you to understand the literature. I want you to understand it's a hormone, and I want you to see the literature support for it. What happens when we lose it? What happens when we replace it? So this is a, a little condensed 15-minute lecture on growth hormone. Please do not use the term growth hormone anymore. Change the name of it. It's no longer growth hormone. It's confusing. People say, I don't want to grow. Now, it doesn't make you grow. Oh, yes, it does. That's why it's called growth hormone. And it causes cancers to grow, too. That's why it's called growth hormone. It causes cancers to grow. Get rid of the, get rid of the word growth. Put the word healing in place of it. It's now called human healing hormone, not human growth hormone. Daniel Rudman, back in 1990, in his New England Journal of Medicine article, stated that overall deterioration of the body that comes with growing old is not inevitable. We now realize that some aspects of it can be prevented and reversed with growth hormone, and that's where the term anti-aging came from. Aging is actually a phenocopy of growth hormone deficiency. The same thing that you see with growth hormone deficiency, you sort of see with aging. And if you look at all the studies where they replace growth hormone, even in patients that were not deficient, just regular, average, everyday people, all of these benefits were seen. You improve muscle mass. You reduce visceral fat. You reduce subcutaneous fat. And as a result, you improve lipids, which helps protect the cardiovascular system. It's beneficial for the immune system. It helps healing. Anyone that's immunocompromised, anyone that is diabetic, anyone that has very poor healing would benefit tremendously by being on growth hormone. It helps cognitive function. It helps memory. We'll look at the brain lecture and all the different studies using SPEC scans that look at the thickness and the amount of beta amyloid protein that's on the neurons. And you can reverse it. You can remove it with growth hormone. Yes, it's thoroughly fascinating. There is a medicine that pulls plaque off and improves function. You have to show that it improves function. You have to have, have, to have some sort of outcome study to show that the memory cognition and the function improve. The outcome studies show that it benefits people. When you look at the spec scans, you can see how much it removes. It's just thoroughly amazing. We've got this drug that works great for Alzheimer's disease, and we ignore it. Why? Because people don't qualify for it. Why? Because those are AACE guidelines. When you reduce visceral fat, subcutaneous fat with growth hormone, and you increase muscle mass, what's it do to insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance? It reverses it. You don't need to take three diabetic medicines. You just need to optimize your growth hormone, lose the visceral fat, use, lose the subcutaneous fat. There's your treatment for your diabetes. The circumstantial evidence that growth hormone deficiency and aging overlap. That's why patients love it, embrace it. They want it. Doctors completely resist it. Life without growth hormone is poor, both in quality and quantity. Unfortunately, I wish I could put growth hormone back on the backyard tree where the money tree is and everyone would have access to it. 
Um, average cost is around $1,000 a month. It's absolutely ridiculously expensive, which is why most people can't, won't afford it. But in every study, when we replace it, there's benefits. I can't tell you the number of patients that I've seen over 20 years that have benefited from it. Growth hormone peaks at puberty and your levels don't continue to fall until old age. At age 60, most adults have a 24-hour growth hormone output that is very similar to younger patients that actually have pituitary gland deficiencies and have growth hormone deficiency at a young age. The number of IGF is the same. So if we replace it in young people whose levels are low, then why can't, shouldn't we replace it in older people over 60 who have the same low level? It makes perfect sense. And that's the goal. In a young person that's deficient, we measure IGF-1. That is a protein produced in the liver by growth hormone administration. That's the way we monitor it. You don't monitor growth hormone. You monitor what growth hormone causes, which is a production of a protein in the liver. That protein is called somatomedin or IGF-1. When we're young, our IGF-1 levels are 4, 5, 600. And when we're older, our level falls to around 100 or less. So the goal of therapy in every study is to optimize IGF-1 level, bringing your level back to around 300. That's the level typically for a 30 to 40-year-old. Almost all adults over age 40 will have IGF-1 deficit and will have a level that will indicate that they are actually deficient and they would benefit from growth hormone administration. Again, because of the cost the politics of it, I don't prescribe it or recommend it for most people. If people want it, they come to me and request it, then I will prescribe it. But otherwise, I don't recommend it because of the cost and the hassle of doing it. Journal of Endocrinology Investigation. The fall of growth hormone secretion seen with aging coincides with changes in body composition and lipid metabolism. So what happens when you get older? You get fat. Increase in visceral fat, you lose muscle. When you lose muscle, you lose metabolism. When you lose metabolism, your cholesterol goes up, your HDL falls, triglycerides go up. Increase in cardiovascular disease. So Blackman is now head of NIH. Um, the results from Blackman, he used to be the head of endocrinology um, at Hopkins. The results that they published showed the positive effects on growth hormone on lean body mass. It increases muscle mass decreases central and visceral fat and truncal fat, and it decreases LDL cholesterol, and it improves aerobic capacity. Everything that's bad that happens when we get older can be reversed by growth hormone administration. It's a wonderful hormone. It's a wonderful drug. In addition, as we get older, you lose growth hormone. When you lose it, all of these bad things occur. When you replace it, it reverses all these bad things. It improves bone. It improves muscle. It improves exercise endurance endurance, it decreases truncal and intra-abdominal visceral fat. It improves insulin resistance. It corrects dyslipidemia. It's great for the skin, which is why cosmetic and plastic surgeons love it. And it helps improve our quality of life and how we feel and how we function. Now you know why it's so in such great demand. Now you know why books have been written on it. But unfortunately, because of the expense of it, people say, well, I can't afford that. But nevertheless, this is by Mark Blackman, published in JAMA, and this is what happens when you lose it, and these are things that will improve when you replace it. Aging results in significant loss of all of our hormones, and growth hormone is just one of those hormones that you lose. Replacement in adults prevents and treats the clinical syndrome of aging. Don't use it for anti-aging. Get rid of the term. But you can use it for helping to improve and maintain quality of life and wellness. This is an article that appeared in JAMA, and it showed that when you lose growth hormone around age 40, um, somatopause starts around age 25 and is complete by around age 40. Somatopause is the loss of growth hormone when you finally lose enough of it that your level is low enough for you to be deemed deficient. Um, it coincides with the loss of slow-wave sleep and REM sleep that we see as we get older. And when you replace growth hormone, you improve that deep sleep. So the recommendation, which is very interesting in this article from JAMA, suggests that we should replace growth hormone at a younger age. When? Around age 40, which is when you really start to lose a lot of it. Don't wait till age 65 when your body's been exposed to growth hormone deficiency for 25 years. Replace it around age 40 and prevent those changes from occurring. It only makes sense. That's why we optimize all hormones, and growth hormone is no different. 
Unfortunately, because of the patents and the cost of it, most people cannot and will not afford it. Another study showing when you're losing it and your IGF-1 level falls below a certain level, that's usually around 150, there's increased cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. You lose muscle mass and bone, you increase visceral fat, you get dyslipidemia. Taking growth hormone reverses all of those problems. It is a great hormone. It helps improve body composition. It maintains muscle, which increases metabolism. It burns visceral and subcutaneous fat, which helps prevent insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, and cardiovascular disease. I can't count the number of patients that I've had, probably a dozen or more, that have had congestive cardiomyopathies. I put them on growth hormone. Their cardiac output goes from 15% up to 30%. There's a significant improvement in their functional status. They'll go back and tell their cardiologist the improvement. The cardiologist will measure it on echo to see that their cardiac output is improved. And then when they find out what they're doing, the cardiologist sends the patient to an endocrinologist who says, get off the growth hormone. You don't need that. You don't qualify for it. Stop it. And the patient comes back and says, well, I stopped it. How do you feel? I feel like crap. Well, my doctor's told me to stop it. Okay, well, if you want to feel like crap and you don't mind having a cardiac output of 15%, and stay off of it. Yeah, but my doctor said, your doctors don't understand. It's really a shame. It helps improve quality of life because it reverses the atherosclerotic changes seen in the blood vessels and it improves cardiac output. It unloads the heart. It decreases systemic vascular resistance. It increases ionotropy to increase cardiac output. What drug does that? There is not one. But this works great, I know, but too bad because people don't qualify for it based on guidelines. We'll go over the prescribing it and monitoring it and how to define the deficiency on another section. So quality of life improves. You can reverse carotid intermediate thickness. I address this a little bit in part one. Now we've got the PCS K9 inhibitors that run about $15,000 a month. That combined with maximum statins does reverse plaque. Recent studies show that in order for the PCSK9 inhibitors to be cost effective, the price needs to be lowered to around $4,000 a year. And at the current cost of $15,000 a year, it makes no sense to use it, which I absolutely agree. But what else can we then do to reverse plaque? What drugs reverse plaque? What, else, what other studies have shown plaque reversal? The other studies that show plaque reversal are two milligrams of oral estradiol. It's too bad you can't use estrogen because you're supposed to use it for the shortest period of time in the lowest dose and then stop it. Yeah, but what about the plaque reversal in the carotids? Don't you want that? No. Really? No. But that doesn't make sense. Yeah, but that's what ACOG and NAM says. Lowest dose and stop it. Yeah, but what about all those reversal effects? What other drugs reverse carotid intermediate thickness? Testosterone. There's a recent study that just came out published in JAMA Internal Medicine that showed that and then that took Androgel for one year, the amount of soft plaque increased. Cardiologists have jumped on this and said, everyone's got to stop taking testosterone because of the increase in soft plaque. Well, when you look at the study, the way that they measured the soft plaque is questionable. That's why you don't look at soft plaque because it's not predictive. But when they saw that, they said, oh, it increases soft plaque, that's bad. What's been shown to be predictive is hard plaque. It's a calcified plaque. What happened to the calcified plaque? It decreased. Not much, but it did decrease. But when you look at all the other studies where they used good doses over long term, every study shows reversal of calcified plaque, both in the carotid as well as in the coronary vessels. Every study shows that. But yet this study shows an increase in soft plaque, so now the cardiologists say, okay, well, then you've got to stop it. But when you stop it, what happens? you increase your hard plaque. The way to reverse your hard plaque and decrease coronary calcium scores is with testosterone in high dose over long-term effect, over long-term. But yet everyone's a reactionary. All this study showed increase in soft plaque. Everyone's got to get off of it. If you look at that same series, there was another series that looked at outcomes. What did the outcome study show in men that took the testosterone? Yep decrease in MI, decrease in cardiac events. So if you stop the testosterone because you fear the increase in soft plaque, what you're actually doing then is 
increasing MI and increasing hard plaque and calcified plaque. You completely didn't even look at the other secondary study that was an outcome study that showed decrease in heart attacks. Why don't you look at that outcome study? Why is it you look at soft plaque that is meaningless? That's a reactionary effect as opposed to an analytical effect where, well, yeah, there was an increase in soft plaque, but that pretty much has no prediction. And the way they looked at it and the way they monitored it and the way they diagnosed it is questionable. So it's an interesting study. That's it. It's an interesting observation. That's it. What about all the outcome studies? The outcome studies show decrease in MI in every study except for those flawed studies. What about calcified plaque? Decrease in every study. What about carotid intimal media thickness? Decrease in every study where they looked at it. The benefit of testosterone in decreasing hard plaque and coronary events is tremendous. And yet, what are the cardiologists calling for? You stop it. That's a reactionary. They're completely clueless and don't understand all the benefits that they're losing and missing when they stop it. It makes no sense. They just don't get it. Growth hormone has profound effects on the CNS. We'll look at this in the brain studies. It enhances cognition, memory, alertness, motivation, work capacity. It does cross the blood-brain barrier. And of course, when you look at the SPEC scans, it reverses and removes beta amyloid protein. What a great drug it is. And yet the endocrine society says you don't qualify for it. Your level's not low enough. I don't care what the level is. All the studies looked at, not levels, all the studies looked at, we'll give it to people with Alzheimer's disease and see what happens. And it reverses the plaque. It's amazing what it does. It's amazing what we ignore and denigrate. IGF-1 levels correlate with cognitive function. The higher your IGF-1, the better your cognition and memory. The lower your IGF-1, the worse your cognition and memory. Where would you like your levels to be? I want mine to be high. Well, how do you get the IGF-1 level high? You gotta take growth hormone. Yeah, but I didn't qualify for it. I don't care, get rid of the qualification. Get rid of trying to be painted into a corner by AACE guidelines. Use the numbers as a guide to therapy. This is from JCEM, our Bible of Endocrinology. People that have low levels have poor emotional and psychological functioning. Why would you not want to improve that? Well, they don't qualify for it. They don't qualify for better enhancement of memory and cognition. IGF-1 that goes up when you take growth hormone protects against beta amyloid induced cell death and deposition of beta amyloid protein. Journal of Neuroscience. What is it that we don't understand about these studies? Why is it we ignore it? It's absolutely thoroughly amazing what we ignore. Growth hormone improves bone. Yes, it does cause bone to groan. It's 6% increased bone density. Estrogen is 2% per year. Growth hormone is 6% per year. I've had people that have had DEXA scans of minus 4, minus 5, minus 6. 10 years of being on growth hormone, their DEXA scans are now less than 1.5, less than 1. They have completely reversed all of their osteoporosis. And there's no drug that does that. Biphosphonates do not do that. Biphosphonates slow down your loss. They don't improve bone density. The only thing that improves bone density are hormones. Estradiol, testosterone, growth hormone, and vitamin D, which is also a hormone. Another bone density study and bone mass study, growth hormone helps improve bone density. It helps improve muscle mass. It decreases fat mass. Essential no side effects to the doses that we use. My criticism is the orthopedic industry. Little old lady falls down, breaks her hip. Put a pin in it, throw it in the nursing home. She never gets up and walks again. You give her nothing to help that bone heal. You give her nothing to help the muscle, ligaments, joints, tendons around that bone to heal and get her butt back up and walking again. You've done absolutely nothing to help the anabolic function of that person. The orthopedist response is, that's beyond our scope of practice. That's not my responsibility. Well, whose responsibility is it? It's each and every one of our responsibility. Why did they do the study? And what should we take away from this study? There's tremendous benefits to it. We just simply ignore it. It is really a shame. Another study looking at carotid intimal media thickness. 
It is amazing. It was published, it was published in JCEM. What it does to the carotids, it reverses calcified plaque. It shrinks plaque. There's no drug that does that. Well, now with a PCSK9, yeah, it does. But the side effects of maximum statin, in addition to this drug, in addition to how much it costs, and still, we don't have any outcome studies. We've got outcome studies with growth hormone. It reverses plaque, and there's outcome studies to show decrease in heart disease and a decrease in death. We'll look at that next section on outcome studies. Growth hormone deficient adults have increased cardiovascular mortality. Inflammatory markers are predictive of these coronary events, and growth hormone completely reverses these cardiac markers. It lowers, it reverses C-reactive protein, which is pretty much dependent on visceral fat, and that's how growth hormone works, a decrease in visceral fat. Visceral fat decreases subcutaneous fat, decreases there's improvement in all lipids and lipoproteins. What a tremendous great drug it is, and it's completely ignored by mainstream medicine. Not only is it ignored, but it's denigrated by it. It's really a shame. It's too bad. Increase in contractility, increase in cardiac output. In patients with congestive cardiomyopathies, their symptoms improve. They feel and function better. Doctors take them off the growth hormone. Oh, you don't need that. Oh, something bad is going to happen. Like what? There's nothing bad that happens. What happens is when you stop it, it's really a shame. Another study, JCM, improvement of muscle mass, improvement of cardiac output, strength and body composition improves. When you lose growth hormone, your cardiac output falls. When you replace it, it improves. Absolutely amazing what it does, and it's completely ignored. If we could come up with a drug that would do that, the cardiologist would prescribe it like crazy. Growth hormone? No, we ignore it. Another study, increase in ejection fraction, cardiac output, an improvement in cardiac remodeling. What a great, tremendous drug it is. Everyone with a heart attack or cardiac disease should be on it. You can't be on it because insurance isn't going to pay for it, and it's too expensive, which is really the shame. It helps improve glucose metabolism, improves lipid profile. Look at these studies. Why do we ignore them? What is it that we don't understand? We fear the unknown, and it's really a shame that we ignore the data. Growth hormone deficiency, abnormal body composition, long-term replacement normalizes these abnormalities in body composition, fat mass, subcutaneous mass, muscle mass, strength, endurance, cardiac output, dyslipidemia, cognition, memory. What a great drug it is, and we simply ignore it. It is really a shame. They just don't get it. Growth hormone was administered to people that had abdominal obesity. What happens? They decreased visceral fat, lost trunk fat, lost subcutaneous fat, improvement of all lipid and carbohydrate markers. Another side effect, decreased diastolic blood pressure. That's why it reverses carotid intermediate thickness. That's why statins don't. Statins do not affect visceral fat. There's a slight increase in insulin resistance and diabetes with statins because of the increase in visceral fat. Why do you get an increase in visceral fat with statins? What's it do to your testosterone level? It cuts it in half. When it cuts it in half, what's it do to sexual function? Now you know why you can't get it up. Now you know why you don't want to get it up because you have no testosterone and your libido falls. But we've got to get that cholesterol level down. You can accomplish the same lipid benefits with testosterone, without all the side effects and problems and complications that you get. Absolutely amazing. They just don't get it. This is a study from JCM looking at a baseline level of IGF-1 of 100, which is what most adults have over age 40. It will bump your level up to 313 and over five years down to 268. You get a little bit of tachyphylaxis as you get older. Five years resulted in improvement in all aspects of body composition. Lean muscle mass improved. Bone mineral density improved. HDL improved. It went up. Everything else went down. All the bad guys went down. All the good things went up. What a great drug it is. It's safe and it's well tolerated. Then what is it about it that we don't grasp? We don't grasp it because the AMA and the FDA denigrates it because it's used and abused by adults. Used and abused? A 
accomplishing all these things is abuse. Deficiency, we don't feel or function very well. Replacement, we feel and function so much better. Improvement of quality of life, improvement of sense of well-being. I guess AACE and FDA doesn't want that. But if you look at these journals, look, look at the journals showing the benefits. And why is it that we ignore that? It makes no sense. Wound healing, it's a healthy hormone for beneficial effects on tissues. For those diabetics that don't heal, everyone should be on growth hormone. It is really a shame that it's not FDA approved for that because it certainly should be. Low dose treatment combined with dietary, in, dietary re restriction improves muscle mass and a significant decrease in obesity in type 2 diabetes. It is a fascinating, great drug in patients that are obese, and nothing else will work, and it works tremendously well. Another study showing improvement in lean body mass, decrease in fat mass, decrease in waist, and an improved quality of life. What a great drug it is, and you wonder why people scramble and insist on being treated with growth hormone because of the benefits of it. Feel good wise, health-wise, you really can't beat it. Increase in cardiac performance, increase in our structure, decrease in visceral fat 46%, really? What are the cardiologists doing to reduce visceral fat? Absolutely, entirely nothing. Afraid you gotta lose weight. Martha, gotta go on a diet. Okay, doc, thanks. Thoroughly amazing what we ignore. Growth hormone treatment for 10 years results in improvement of muscle mass improvement of lipids, a decrease in carotid artery intermediate thickness, and an improvement of well-being. What a great drug it is, no side effects, problems, complications to it. Now you understand my passion for hormones. Now you understand my passion as to they just don't get it. Why is it that they don't get it or understand it? They just don't grasp it. They're reactionary as opposed to analytical. Growth hormone is essential for adult life. Without it, life is shortened. Quality of life is reduced. The medical case for growth hormone replacement is now proven beyond any reasonable medical or scientific doubt. Growth hormone IGF-1 research. Let me just briefly review testosterone. Men and, men and women lose testosterone as they get older. According to recent FDA guidelines, that is not reason enough to prescribe it. So just let them suffer? Yes. Yeah, but they feel better when they take it. They don't qualify. So they're just supposed to live that the rest of the life not feeling well? Yes. I and mean, we're supposed to ignore the thousands of medical journal articles that show that there's a benefit to it? Yes. And we just let them get old and fat? Yes. And die from cardiovascular disease? Yes. And depression? Yes. And have no sexual function? Yes. And no libido? Yes. And you call yourselves good doctors? Yes. I hope you enjoy my sarcasm because what we do and what they do makes no sense based on the medical literature. About 10, 15 years ago, I had a collection of about a dozen additional um, journal booklets that were put out by the major medical journals, OBGYN, Menopause, um, AACE, um, Journal of Urology that address the issue of testosterone in women. It is thoroughly amazing the number of studies out there that show benefit, and it's thoroughly amazing our medical societies can't get together to get an FDA-approved drug to help improve quality of life that's shown in all of these studies. It just irks me. Does testosterone decrease, decrease with age? It does in everyone. <clears throat> but yet, those are not FDA indications. The fact that your testosterone level falls with age is not an indication based on recent FDA guidelines that are trying to restrict. Really? Yeah. So I have to live like this forever? Yeah. And life sucks? Yeah. And so I don't qualify for it. No one's going to give it to me because my level's not less than 300. That's correct. Well, for the last 20 years, we didn't have that restriction. That's correct. So why do we suddenly have it now? Because that's the way it is. Because the FDA's trying to restrict it. Yeah, but that doesn't make sense. Yes, I know it doesn't make sense, but that's reality medicine. Sorry. Yeah, but what about all the benefits that I'm going to lose if you don't prescribe it for me? That's tough. What about women? Those same benefits in women 
are the same benefits in men. They're no different. They derive benefit from it also. So this was that questionnaire that was the ADAM score. And if you had these symptoms that you would benefit from testosterone, and I don't know anyone over age 40, man or woman, that does not suffer from fatigue, depression, loss of memory, loss of sex drive, difficulty with erections, difficulty with sex, loss of erections. That, that was the test that I used to use. If you do not wake up with a morning erection, your testosterone level is too low. Welcome to 30 hood. Decreased intensity of erection. So um, when I was on testosterone, um, my orgasms were much better. And now, doctor, since you took me off of it, um, I don't feel anything. Uh, can't you put me back on? No, you don't qualify. You mean I got to live like this forever? Yeah. Well, that sucks. Yeah. Well, what do you mean I don't qualify? Why don't you want me to have a better sex life? Because you don't qualify for it. How is it that I don't qualify for it? Well, under new FDA guidelines. Interesting, isn't it? It makes no sense why they recommend what they recommend based on the literature. When you lose testosterone in men, it's the same effect as when you lose estrogen in women. There's an adverse effect on our health and wellness. And 90% of men and women will die from cardiovascular disease, which you can protect against by optimizing your hormones. But yet, they just don't get it. They don't grasp it. Later in part two, we'll look at all the benefits to replacing estradiol and protection against cardiovascular disease and how we don't want to extrapolate the harm of Premarin and Provera to estradiol progesterone. We'll also look at the benefits for cardiovascular disease protection with testosterone in all of those studies which we tend to ignore, which is very unfortunate. That's a reactionary's effect. Oh, it increases soft plaque, you shouldn't use it. Yeah, but what about the other 5,000 studies that show benefit and decrease in MI? Well, we're going to ignore those. Yeah, but those are randomized controlled trials. We ignore them. Well, what about all the meta-analysis of all the randomized controlled trials that showed benefit? We're going to ignore those too. Yeah, well, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I know. Then why do we do it? They just don't grasp it. The male menopause is less sudden than the female menopause, but it's just as severe as the long-term consequences. You simply replace it the testosterone back to the levels of a young adult and for symptomatic improvement. There's an increased risk of heart attacks and strokes in men and women that lose hormones. There's loss of brain function, cognitive properties, and an increase in Alzheimer's disease. It's thoroughly amazing. Alzheimer's disease is a billion-dollar disease that can be prevented with hormones, and we simply ignore it. Oh, if I could become Surgeon General. Loss of drive and competitive edge. We just get tired, want to come home, lay in the chair, not move. Following level of fitness. I don't have strength or energy to go work out. There's decreased effectiveness of workouts when you lose your testosterone. And all this can be completely reversed by optimizing your testosterone in both men as well as in women. Same thing. Women also will become depressed, fatigued. Testosterone reverses that. We saw that in the part one articles from JAMA and the New England Journal of Medicine. As far as sexual function, we've already reviewed all of that. Intensity of orgasms, everyone loses it as you get older. The only way to get that back is to optimize your testosterone level. And all of these guys out there, it's got to be guys, making these decisions on trying to limit testosterone availability to men, I wonder how many of them are not on testosterone. So how's your loss of orgasmic ability working out for you? They've got to be sneaking it. They've got to be sneaking it. They've got to know. They've got to understand. It's just really a shame. Better sexual function, better erectile function, better orgasmic function, and I'm not talking just for men, also for women. It's not related to dose or method of delivery. It has to do with optimizing levels. If you still don't see an improvement, you've got receptor site resistance that needs to be overcome by Higher doses. The literature supports that. Sometimes you need to be very much super physiologic in order to improve symptoms. This also has the same effect in the brain as does estrogen in the women, probably because of the aromatization of testosterone into estradiol. Testosterone protects and reverses beta amyloid protein deposition. Every study shows the same thing. Why is it that we ignore it? Well, they don't qualify for it. They don't qualify for protection against Alzheimer's disease? Please explain that to me. 
How do they not qualify? Well, the numbers are not low enough. It has nothing to do with numbers. It has to do with optimizing levels and protecting that protein from being deposited. JCEM. This also correlates with cognitive function and improves it. The lower your level, the greater your risk of cognitive decrease. The higher your level, the greater protection and decrease in Alzheimer's disease incidence. Mood, depression, will improve with testosterone administration. Antidepressants do not work in men, sorry. Maybe a few. But what does antidepressants do to sexual function and erections? Kills it. Well, that's great. Probably the reason we have the depression and dysphagia in the first place is because we have the sexual dysfunction. And now we're going to take a drug that makes it even worse? And we call ourselves good doctors? Yeah. It makes no sense whatsoever. This also is associated with fatigue, loss of sense of well-being. Higher levels improve fatigue and improve energy. Higher levels. Uh, did they see any improvement in these studies where the total testosterone level went from 300 to 400? No, of course not. Would you expect to see any improvement? No, of course not. Yeah, but that was the result of the study. Look to see what the study says. Look at what the numbers are. Look at what they use. And it makes perfect sense why it didn't work. But that doesn't mean that other doses in other people and optimizing it will not work because all the literature shows it does. That's another study that should be trashed. Reactionary said, aha, see, it didn't work. Analytical thinking says, well, of course it didn't work. Anyone can make sense out of that. But all the other studies show that it does work when you optimize it. Men with heart disease had significantly lower testosterone levels. Every study shows when your level is low, there's an increased risk. Every study shows when your level is high, it's protective. Acute administration causes an improvement of endothelial function. That's the key, endothelial function. And that's what we don't quite understand or grasp is the importance of nitric oxide release with the use of testosterone. American Journal of Cardiology. Intracoronary injections causes dilatation. It unloads the heart. It is vasodilatation. That's why there's a decrease in ischemia, both on treadmill testing as well as symptomatology. There's a coronary relaxing effect in testosterone, medical journal circulation. In men that have heart disease, bad heart disease, ischemic heart disease will benefit from testosterone. All the cardiologists are saying, no, you've got to get off of it. Yeah, but when I got off of it, I didn't feel as well. You're right. My angina got worse. You're right. And so is your deposition of, of plaque going to get worse. And so is your calcified ASVD going to get worse when you stop it. Yeah, but my doctor scared me. Your doctor's clueless, with all due respect. Testosterone decreases fat mass. Testosterone and estradiol correlate with bone density. Don't lower estrogen. Don't block it, as I preached. In part three, we'll look at all the studies to show harm when you block aromatization in men. Replacement improves insulin sensitivity. Protects against diabetes. Protects against syndrome X, hypertension, diabetes, fibromyalgia, coronary artery disease. It protects against it. Look at what the studies show. Why would you not want to protect against it? Well, they don't qualify for it. Really? They don't qualify for all this protection? It's just absolutely amazing what the FDA and the AACE have done by the recent political restrictions against the use of testosterone. It's important for the sense of well-being in women. It helps improve strength, muscle mass, libido, sexual function, clitoral sensitivity, just like erectile sensitivity and orgasmic function in men. Body composition, it helps maintain muscle and burn fat. It's anabolic, muscle ligaments, joints, tendons, bones. And yet it's not approved for women, and AAC says we don't recommend it for women. You don't recommend all those things for women? No. You don't recommend this for your wife? Well, maybe that's different. But we don't recommend it for the public. Shame on you. Improvement of sexual function, improvement of psychological well-being, we saw that in part one. Testosterone should be FDA approved for all women over age 40 that have symptoms of a deficiency. It makes no sense. It's not just a sex hormone. It's needed for energy, strength, cognitive function, and, of course, for sex, too. It's the feel-good hormone of both men and women. 
when you lose estrogen, you will have an adverse effect. And every study shows an increased risk of heart disease, strokes, osteoporosis, fractures, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, urogenital atrophy, chronic urinary tract infections, depression, mood swings, sleep disorder, maximum degeneration, loss of vision, loss of tooth, memory loss. That's what happens when you lose estrogen. Oh, but you shouldn't replace it. Use the lowest dose for the shortest period of time and then stop it. And when you stop it, you want to increase the risk of all these things? Is that what you're saying? Well, that's what ACOG and NAM says. That's because ACOG and NAMs don't get it. They can't extrapolate. They don't understand the benefit and protection with estradiol and progesterone. And they extrapolate the harm of, excuse me, of Premarin and Provera to estradiol and progesterone. They shouldn't. The literature supports the opposite. But because they're funding and unfortunately their connection with Big Pharma, they still have to continue to promote Prempro. And as a result, they use low dose, shortest period of time, and stop it. Yeah, but then, you mean I got to suffer with all of these things? Yes. But that makes no sense. Yes. Well, that's ridiculous. That's reactionary. They don't get it. I just read another article out of a neurology journal that questioned the safety of testosterone. And the purpose of the article is to show that testosterone was very safe. But it was interesting. They said, well, we don't want to make the same mistake with testosterone that we made with estrogen, thinking that estrogen was beneficial, and now we realize that estrogen is harmful. Really? You think estrogen is harmful? Well, yeah, that's what the WHI trial showed. Really? You can't figure that out. Well, yeah, it says uh, lowest dose, shortest period of time, and stop it. That's what the recommendation is. They don't get it. They can't understand the benefits of estradiol and progesterone and the lack of harm of it. And they just don't get it, which is really a shame. It's a sad commentary. When you lose estrogen, you'll get vaginal atrophy, chronic urinary tract infections, changes in your skin, bones, breast, fatigue, loss of libido, urogenital atrophy, making sex difficult. You lose the anti-aging effects on your tissues and on your well-being. And you don't want to take it. Well, my doctor told me to stop it. It was going to cause a heart attack or a stroke. Really? That's what your doctor said? Yeah. He cited the WHI trial. They just don't get it. By the end of part two, you will get it. You'll look at all those studies, and you'll look at the comparative studies, and then you'll finally come away with you cannot compare them to be the same. And when you do, you'll completely miss it. the benefit of estrogen. Now women are demanding the natural estradiol instead of the synthetic hormones. Um, studies show that Premarin was beneficial for 30 years. But most recently, there's an increase in blood clots. We'll look at that in the next section. The incidence of blood clots with Premarin. There is a slight increase in incidence. What is the incidence of blood clots with natural estradiol? There's good, big NIH studies. The first one was the West then the CORA, then the EPAT, that showed reversal of plaque, then the Danish, then the Kronos, or the KEEP study, then the ELITE study, all using oral estradiol. Any increased risk of strokes, heart attacks in any of those studies? No. Increased incidence of blood clots, DVTs, PEs? No. Then where does it come from? Well, the WHI trial, no, that's premarin. Well, you have to assume it's the same. No. If you assume it's the same, you will assume incorrectly because the data in the studies show don't assume. The one article in, published in JAMA showed that there is an increased risk of blood clots with Premarin in the first year of taking it, relative risk 1.8. The relative risk in, of oral estradiol was 0 0.9. That was a comparative study. Progesterone did not increase the risk. The, the risk was still 0 0.9 with oral estradiol. It goes up with Premarin. It goes down with estradiol. Well, but you have to assume the risks are the same. No, that's a reactionary. If you're analytical and you look at all the studies, you will analyze they're not the same. And the studies show the complete opposite. Natural HRT provides all the benefits of HRT without the side effects, problems, and complications and blood clot issues associated with Premarin. Premarin was used for decades. There are some side effects and problems, um, and that is because of the first-pass effect going through the liver, increasing clotting factors. 
but it's really the increase in estrogenicity. Premarin is 15% estradiol. It's about 50% estrone, about 30% equal and equilenin, which do cause blood clots, and about 10 extra estrogens also that have clotting factors. So all of those estrogens added up increase significantly the potency or estrogenicity in the liver of increasing those blood clots. We do not see that with estradiol. Therefore, natural estradiol and progesterone have evolved with the human. We should use those steroids. We should not use the synthetic and don't extrapolate the harms of CEE, MPA to estradiol and progesterone. Unfortunately, mainstream medicine does. They shouldn't. Synthetic HRT does have some adverse effects. The first one to study this was Hardgrove et al. that published their findings in the Infertility and Reproductive Clinics of North America, where they used the bioidenticals and found pretty much no side effects, problems, or complications in comparison with the synthetics and significant side effects with the synthetics that you did not see with the bioidenticals. Progesterone is, again, very confusing for most practitioners. If you look in the PDR, it says in the PDR, under Prometrium, the same write-up as for Provera. It shows that Prometrium increases breast cancer, heart attack, strokes, blood clots, DDTs, and PEs. It increases side effects, problems, and complications, identical to that of Provera, because the write-up is identical to that of Provera. But that's not true in any study. Now, I know, but then why did they say it? Because they could. And now you see the confusion. There's tremendous health benefits. There's many feel-good benefits. There's absolutely no reason not to give progesterone to all postmenopausal women or premenopausal women that need it for symptom improvement. More importantly, there's progesterone receptor sites throughout the body, not just in the uterine tissue. There's receptor sites in the breast, brain, bone, vaginal epithelium, blood vessels. Progesterone is synergistic with estrogen. Progesterone is antagonistic and moderates many of the side effects of estrogen, mostly the fluid retention, the bloating, the swelling. So it is a great drug. It is a hormone that has none of the side effects, problems, and complications as the synthetic project stims. Again, hard growth at all, titrated progesterone to premenopausal levels, which was 10 or greater. They found no intermediate proliferation with a level of 10, and the dose that they used was 200 milligrams oral capsule. Progesterone is beneficial in reducing symptoms of menopause, reducing symptoms of perimenopause, reducing symptoms of PNS. It protects against uterine cancer, breast cancer. We'll see the effects on breast cancer when we look at part two cancer section. It helps the bones, it helps the cardiovascular system. It was the PEPI trial that put micronized progesterone on the map because in this study they looked at micronized progesterone versus Provera. With Provera, decrease in HDL, increase in plaque deposition, increase in inflammation, increase in MI. With progesterone, slight increase in HDL, none of the adverse effects that you see with Provera on the vasculature, clotting, etc. So that's where Prometrium and micronized progesterone got put on the map, was in the PEPI trial that showed cardiovascular protection as opposed to Provera that we know antagonizes or reverses all of estrogen's beneficial effects. Progestins cause depression, swelling, breast tenderness, bleeding, weight gain, increase in insulin resistance, increase in diabetes, increase in visceral fat and a significant increase in breast cancer. The only organ that progestin likes, that progestins like, are the uterus. All other tissues, organs, and systems, progestins don't like and have an adverse effect. You see none of this with micronized progesterone, but yet mainstream medicine completely ignores all the studies to show benefit. I'm still looking, and I've been looking for 20 years, I'm still looking for that study that showed that micronized natural bioidentical progesterone is harmful in some way. I haven't found it yet. It's been beneficial in every study. Progestins, uncomfortable side effects, problems and complications that you do not see with micronized progesterone. Therefore, it's a natural estradiol, the natural progesterone that should be used 
in contrast to Provera that has all these side effects and problems and complications associated with it, but when you look in the PDR, they are absolutely the same. But nobody's going to go back in and change that, which is very unfortunate. So you have to use your medical literature and your studies and your data to show patients, show the doctors, they are not the same. They are completely different. So in my practice, I use bioidentical hormones metabolized by normal metabolic pathways that avoid the problem causing metabolites. It is the best preventive medicine. That's why we do what we do. So this is the end of section one. I will now